Hey, it's Joe Fair with Geek Toolkit. I want to tell you a quick story. My cousins came to me and they wanted to learn how to code. And I was trying to send them a video to help them learn. And what I learned from that is there's a lot of videos on how to code on the internet, but none of them were really kind of linking with them. They're both passionate about football. And I thought, what if we had a video that was how to code based on your knowledge of football? I couldn't find that, so that's what I decided to create. This is going to be a very quick tutorial that just as an experiment, let me know in the comments if this works for you. If you know a little bit about football, then this might actually teach you the basics of coding. It's not a full coding course, but if it goes well, I'll make more videos. The first thing is, what do you need to know about football? Well, just basic stuff. You don't have to be a player or anything. Just understand things like there's a field with end zones and goal posts and how much a touchdown versus a, a field goal, you know, how many points it is. And then understanding the difference between like a play and a route will help out. If you understand those basics, which is pretty much about where I'm at with football, then you should be good to go here. Now, what do you need to know about computers? Well, this is for people that don't know a lot about computers, so I'm going to actually explain some of the basics. The first thing I want to talk about is input, logic, and output, which is a thing I'll, I'll come back to quite a bit, actually, because it's used in not only how the computer works with you, but also how code works with data. So let's start with input. Here's some input devices. Input devices are things where when you use them, you tell the computer something that it needs to know some kind of data. The first one I show is a game controller. And when I say computer, if you think about it, it doesn't have to be a laptop or um, a PC. It can be uh, your microwave has compute, um, you know, computer stuff in it. Your game console, your Xbox, or your PlayStation, or your Wii has compute stuff in it. They're kind of computers. Your cell phone even is a form of computer. So. You can think about all of these, you know, any if you're using the buttons on your microwave, the game controller, you're sending input to that thing, that is an input device. Keyboard, mouse, these are things that tell the computer what you're trying to do, they tell you intent. The webcam's a great input device, it actually sends images or video across. And then of course you've got a headset where you're using the microphone to send audio data to the computer. Now of course there's much more than this, but I just want to get that concept of you telling the computer something. Now, if you think about this, output is the computer telling you something. A couple of these are actually input and output devices. For instance, the headset, if you think about the speakers, they're actually giving you, the user, information. They're giving you audio data as you give the computer audio data. So that is an input and an output device. The game controller, if you think about like a game controller, the modern one that has rumble, the rumble is actually an output from the computer to you to tell you something. The buttons would be input to the computer. This might sound really basic, but we'll come back to this as we get into the coding stuff later, and you'll see that input and output in, is most of what you do with coding. You, you accept input, you process it, and you give back output. Now, the thing in the middle the, the stuff that glues it all together that makes this interesting is logic. And logic is just simply coming to a conclusion based on your input data. Football has a ton of logic. Think about any play, any play situation. Think about, you know, a fourth down with the first series of the game. Do you try to kick a field goal? Do you punt? Well, it's going to be based on what yard line you're on. Think about fourth down being down by two points at the last second of the game on the 10 yard line. That decision is a very different decision, but we made that decision going back to input. I talked about input for a computer as being game controllers and stuff, but if you think about in football terms, things like knowing what yard line you're on, how many seconds are on the clock, what down you're on, those are all inputs that you use to make a decision and then you would run a play, that would be the end of the decision, and then the output of the play would be the result. Now what's interesting in football is the result of the play gives you more input. 
So now the down, the time, the score might all change with that play. And then you take input and you decide your next play. This is actually very much how programming works. In programming or coding, we take input data from the keyboard, the mouse or whatever, and then we run it through logic. And that's actually the code that we're writing is how we, we process that data, do the logic, and then we write code to send the output back to the user so that they get some result that they need. Maybe it's playing an audio file, maybe it's calculating you know, two numbers put together, maybe it's an entertainment thing like a game. All of those take input, do logic, and then they provide output. Let's talk about output. Output is how the computer tells the user the result of the logic. The monitor is one of the most obvious for output, but also you can think about audio from speakers. On your cell phone, you've got the monitor, speakers, also the vibrate we talked about on both the game controller or your cell phone if it's ringing. These are outputs. They're telling the user something's going on. I also put a virtual reality headset in here because I want you to think outside the box on both inputs and outputs. Virtual reality headsets very much got an output. It could have audio coming into the ears and vision coming into the eyes to help tell the user something interesting or put them into another world. It's an output device. Now let's go into our first bit of code. Now that we understand input, output, and logic, let's talk about the logic of telling the computer, go score a touchdown. Now when I talk about these things, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, what I'm trying to teach you is the, how you would talk to a computer on in code. None of this is actual code. None of it would actually run, but what will happen is it will get you familiar with the syntax and the steps that you would have to take. What we'll do in future lessons is we'll apply those to actual code and you'll see the parallels then. But the first thing we have to understand is if I want this football player to go to the end zone and I say, go score a touchdown, the player might get very confused. And part of this is the thinking through this is how you have to think when you do coding on a computer. Computers are neither smart nor dumb. They simply do exactly what they're told but they only can do what they're told with the data they understand. Player to run to this end zone, I have to give the player more data than run to an end zone because there's two different options. Well, let's look at this. What if I told the player run for a touchdown and I've got the end zones labeled, the Cougars end zone and the Mud Dogs end zone. And I can tell the player run to the Cougars end zone and now the player would have a much more uh, informed decision and it wouldn't be confused. When we talk to computers and code, we have to be very explicit in the same way. If you look at the player and the end zone, and then I've, I've got at the bottom here typed run for touchdown, but in parentheses, but which way? The parentheses inside of those, we're gonna fill that in with Cougar's end zone. So now you see the sentence run for touchdown and parentheses, Cougar's end zone. What I'm doing there is called giving the computer a parameter. Parameters are things that we give the computers for actions which might have various results. An example, if I were to tell you to throw a football 10 yards, or throw a football 50 yards, or throw a football 20 yards, it's the same action. But there's different, I'm telling you how far to throw it, that's a variation of that action that will give you different results. On, for computers, when we do this, we put it in parentheses. So you've got your command, or in this case, uh, what's called a function, and then in parentheses, you have your parameter that kind of tells it some more data about the function. The nice thing about this is if I teach the computer, which is basically what com coding is, we're teaching the computer how to do something. If I teach the computer how to run to an end zone, I don't have to teach it yet again how to run to the other end zone. I just teach the computer how to run to an end zone and then give it a different parameter. Here's some other examples of functions. One is throw ball, and then I put 30, like throw the ball 30 yards. The next one under it is hurdle defender. You notice there, I've got the parentheses, but I don't have anything in there because there is no parameter needed for that one. 
and then perform touchdown celebration, and then a parameter of the Macarena. Again, these are just examples, but I want you to just get familiar with what a command looks like and understanding that in the parentheses is the variation on the command. The words themselves are the commands. Notice that we don't put any spaces in any of these. When we use computing, they hate spaces. The computers get really confused with spaces. So a lot of programming languages, you don't use spaces when you name things. You smush it all together. Sometimes you'll use things like capitalization to help make it a little bit more readable though. The next thing I want to get into are what are called classes and objects. I used to think this was a really complex topic, but after working with it for a few years, I feel like this explanation will make this very straightforward. A class is simply, I think of it as a blueprint. If I were to give you a blueprint for a football, it would have things about the football, like maybe the size, the weight, the, um, you know, the shape of it, uh, what to write on it, stuff like that. It's just a description. It's not an actual football. Now, if I were to hand you an actual football based on that blueprint, we would call that, in computers, we call that an object. The act of converting from that blueprint to an object is called instantiating. And sometimes the object is called an instance because of that word instantiating. Now, if I were to hand you the blueprint of a football and say, let's go throw the football around, it wouldn't make any sense. It, doesn't, it wouldn't be fun either unless you, I don't know, fold it up or something. But that's not what you want. You want the actual object. That's what you're going to use. Computing has a very similar concept. In a class, we define something that we're going to make a bunch of. Think of it almost like a factory. And I'll get into that more in the next slide. But it's a description. It's not something we actually use. The object is an instance of it, of that blueprint, an actual thing that we do use. And we can create many objects from one class. That's the beauty of classes. So let me show you an example of what I mean there. Let's talk about football players. Football players all have very similar traits. They're all, let's say, human beings. They have pads, they have helmets, they have jerseys. They are, you know, they're, they're all very similar. Imagine if I was trying to create a, a football player factory and I had to be very explicit about how to create each one. If I went through and described like, I want a helmet and pads and so on to create the first player, got the first player created to my liking, and then wanted to go through that again to create the second player, that would be very inefficient. Programming, one of the, the nice things about it is it's about efficiency. And the better your efficiency, the faster that you'll program, the faster the program runs. If you ever run something that's very slow, it might be a very powerful program or it may not be well written. There's just not the efficiency there. So let's look at that example a little bit closer. Here's a football field. It's got end zones, it's got goal posts, it's got players. Little circles are players. I couldn't draw players very well. Now, going back to our language of classes and objects, I've got 11 players on the field. They're all of a class that I'm calling football player. Remember now, the class is the blueprint. And what I would say is, hey computer, I'm gonna create class football player, and each football player has a jersey, helmets, you know, um, pads, and all of the things that a football player would have. Once I had that blueprint pretty much locked in for a generic football player, I would instantiate 11 times and I would get out 11 football players. It's almost like cloning. I've got 11 clones of this object. And that's what you would see on the field here. Now, other examples of classes and objects, we've talked a lot about football players, but you can imagine there would also be a class that would be a blueprint for what an end zone is. And it would talk about, you know, maybe the width and the height of an end zone and the location. And then we would instantiate two end zones one for each side of the field. So there's two instances of the end zone object based on the end zone class. Another way of saying that is we've made 
two end zones based on this blueprint. Okay. The same with the goalposts. There's two goalposts. We would create one blueprint of what a goalpost looks like, and then we would instantiate it twice to have two goalposts. Now this is something that's uh, just a bit uh, conceptual, but if you understand this, it will take you very far, very fast in programming because it's one of the more challenging things I think to learn because it's very different than just kind of looking at lines. I think though that this example, what I'm hoping is that this breaks it down enough so that as we go through the rest of this tutorial, you'll understand how it links together. And by the end of it, you'll get the concept down that there is a blueprint and it creates called class that creates objects. And then we'll talk more about those objects. Let's talk about the players a little bit closer. Here's five of those player objects that we created on the field. Each one of them is a football player, but they each have a different name. It's very similar to how football works. You've got to, you know, if you say how many football players are on the field, you might say 22 for both teams, but, and there are, but every one of them is different. They have a different name. If you wanted to tell one of the football players to do something, you would talk to them by name. But even though they all have different names, they're still football players. I think that's probably obvious when you hear it that way, but in computing, if you apply that concept, it will help understanding about classes and instances. These five football players, let's say are on the field. If I wanted, we talked earlier about run for touchdown. If I wanted Beeman to run for a touchdown, I could say Beeman run for touchdown. And that one instance or that one object would go run across the field. Well, we'd say run for touchdown and then in parentheses, which end zone to run to. This is kind of how computer, actually it's not kind of, this is how computer programming works. You have instances of objects, you tell them to, you call functions on them, and then you tell them what to do and each one will do whatever function you call on it. The football players that are on the field, we talked about each of them having different names, but that's not the only differences. There's actually a lot of differences between football players. If you think about the, uh, like a football card and the back of it and all the stats that a football player have, those are all things that are different about football players. Some of them are going to run faster. Some of them are going to be in different positions. Some of them uh, might have different color, you know, different teams. So they'll have different colored jerseys, uh, different heights, different weights. In computing computers, we call these properties of an object. So if we have a football player object, they have different properties, like what team they're on, what position they're on. Now, all football players have very similar actions they can do. They might all, uh, they might be able to run down the field or juke or hurdle. Some of them can actually throw a ball. Uh, some of them have to be able to catch a ball. Some of them have to be able to block. These are actions on a, of a football player, things that they can do, they're verbs. They're called methods and they look a lot like the functions we talked about before, but they're off of these, uh, the football player classes that we we're talking about now. The function versus method naming isn't so important. It's something that will make sense more later and you'll get as you have been programming for a bit. But I wanted to specify that so that as you learn and you go into other courses, when they say the word method, you'll know what does that refer back to in this tutorial that I'm going over now. Some of the methods that I've mentioned here are run route, catch ball, or run for touchdown. You notice they all have the parentheses after that makes that's denoting that they're a verb, that they're a method. It's different than a property. Now let's talk about, we started out with showing how to get a football player to run downfield and what that would look like to the computer when we program the computer. 
let's do that for a object uh, running forward 10 yards. So in this case, the object, the player that we're talking to is named Tidwell. And we're saying Tidwell run forward 10 yards. It's a simple run play in football. Well, <laughs> it's simple if there's not somebody there to tackle him. So this is the template for how we talk to objects with methods. Remember, methods are the verbs or the actions. Objects going to be the football player. So for that sentence we just talked about, Tidwell run forward 10 yards, it ends up looking like this. Tidwell dot run forward. Remember, we take out the spaces because we don't want to confuse the computer. And then we don't need to say yards in this case because when we would program the computer on how to do the run forward command, we would just say whatever the number is, assume yards. You're not going to tell them to run 10 inches. So Tidwell run forward 10. The tens of parameter, we put that in parentheses. Run forward is the method, which is very similar to the function that we use, but it's on a, on a object. Tidwell is the object. To take it one step further, Tidwell is a football player class. That's the class that created Tidwell. Remember, the class is the blueprint. Here's some other examples. Say that we want that Tidwell player to be able to catch the ball or to, to do the action of catching a ball. We would do Tidwell dot catch ball parentheses because it's a verb. Or if we want Tidwell to do a stiff arm, the object dot the method parentheses. The idea behind this is if you understand this, it will make learning coding so much easier in the future, but you've got to get the, the basic syntax out of the way, what's called the syntax of how the words go together. And that's what we're trying to do here. All right, so now let's talk about slant routes. If you think about a route, a route's actually several commands in a row. So think about a slant route as running forward, turning, and then running forward again. That's three different commands that you're giving a player. This doesn't include things like catching and being on the line and all that. There's a lot more, of course. But the thing is, you wouldn't go tell a player, hey, go run the run forward, turn and run slant, or run at an angle. You just say, hey, run a slant route. And then the player would know what to do. What I've done is taken the commands for a slant route and I've, I'm calling it computerized them a little bit. I made it look a little bit more like code. So we have a method called run forward and then a parameter of 10, the method of turning and a parameter of 15. And the idea is like they're turning 15 degrees to the right and then run forward 20 yards. So again, method parameters in parentheses. Here's an out route, run forward, turn 90 degrees, run forward, 15. These three, th three methods, we're grouping them together and we're calling it an out route. What's nice about this is again, when you tell the player to run a route, you don't say all of the things in a route, you just, it has a name. You tell the player the name. Computers are the same way. You don't wanna tell the computer the same you know, lines over and over again. So if you have a bunch that you repeat a lot, then you can group them together and give them a name and then just use that name instead. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what that looks like for a computer. We talked about the slant route. We talked about the three commands underneath it. What you see I've done is I've indented those three commands over a little bit. That way it tells the computer, hey, these are the commands that go to this slant route. Now in some syntax, such as Python, the indenting is all you have to do. And Python's a computer language. There's a lot of computer languages out there and they do these things a little bit differently. Since my next step is to show you how to do this in code in what's called the C language, I'm gonna show you how to make the computer understand that by using some, you know, some other things here. I'll show you what that looks like. So first we want to name the, the method slant route. 
when you have the parentheses there telling it it's a method. And then for the, the particular language that I'm talking about, I actually have a curly brace. And that curly brace denotes the start of what's called a block. A block is something that you know we indented in, but the block will have a start and an end of around these three commands. And the idea is that you want these three commands to go to that, that name. So now you can see what I've done is I've started it with the open curly brace and I've ended it with the closing curly brace. The three commands, run forward, turn right, and run forward, are now locked in to that name slant route. Once I've done this, I've defined for the computer what the word slant route means. It's almost like the computer now learned a new word in its vocabulary and it understands the word slant route now. So then when I call the method on the object Tidwell, or to go back to our football speak, hey Tidwell, go run a slant route. It's Tidwell dot the method name slant route. I don't have to do tidwell dot run forward, tidwell dot turn. I don't have to do that anymore. From now on, once I've defined that, I could do tidwell dot slant route. And now the computer is acting very much as a coach would to a player. Again, going back to the same concept, coach wouldn't tell the player three different commands. The coach would just tell the player to run a slant route. Now, think about the football huddle. And think about how awkward it would be if the the quarterback had to tell a you know the other ten players every play what route to run. That would be crazy. You know, hey, go run an out route. Go run a slant route. You you block to the left. You block to the right. It would be crazy. So what football has is they have a what's called a play. And if a quarterback calls a play, then everybody on the team knows what they're supposed to do. This is very similar in concept to what we just did of telling a player one word, slant route, and having them know three commands. Now we're going to tell the entire team one word, and they're all going to know what to do. So all we're doing here is taking and what's called nesting. We're going to take three of the methods that we have, and we're going to put them together, and we're going to give it a play name. The play name is Quick Pass. And now you can start seeing how those those objects link in. We're telling Tidwell to do the slant route. We're telling Steeman Beeman to do an out route. And we're telling Shane Falco to do a slant route. Tidwell, Steeman Beeman, and Shane Falco are the player names. They're also objects. They're all of the football player class type. I'm just kind of doing that to keep reviewing the vocabulary because it gets confusing. But when you look at these lines, Tidwell, he's going to run his route. Stephen Beeman's going to run his route. Shane Falco is going to run a slant route. And they're all going to do that every time the words quick pass are used. The computer now is learning not only a route, but a play. Now I've changed the formatting a little bit just to show you what it would look like in actual code terms. We have the function, or I'm sorry, the method quick pass, and then you have an open curly brace. Again, this is the block. You've got the three routes, and then you've got a closed curly brace. Now, of course, on a football team, you'd have to, for a play, you'd have to tell all of the players what to do, but this is just an example. To keep things a little bit more simplified and clean, we're just telling a couple receivers what to do on this one play. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here where we can take things, group them together, put them with curly braces, give them a name, and then teach the computer a new command. Now, at this point, you might be asking yourself, what does a computer program actually look like, though? Does it look, you know, what, what else is there besides these commands? Well, obviously, you, you can give the computer commands and teach the computer commands. Well, there's another part that I won't get into in this video, but it goes more into the logic of what's called flow. And the code flow will do things like say, if this condition happens, then go execute this command. Now that's really kind of how football works anyway. 
if it's first down, then maybe we call this play. But if it's fourth down, maybe we call this play. And again, you'll start, you know, we've talked about this earlier where the inputs tell you which decisions to make. So in the next video, what I would do is talk about computer logic. I would talk about inputs and how those flows work. But before I get there, there's one other thing that we have to learn, and that is what's called variables. For the data to be, the data that's input into a computer, we have to store it somewhere so that the computer can what's called reference it. So if you think about what this looks like in a, for a football field is the scoreboard. Think about storing the score on the scoreboard so that you remember it and it's, it's it can be referenced. Like what's the score? You look at the scoreboard. It's like referencing the scoreboard. We're going to talk about that more, but before I get there, I want to do a, I want to do these slow builds so that you get the concepts and the building blocks of how we get to where we end up. So the first thing I want you to think about is how much is a touchdown worth? Like how many points? So it's six points. Now, does that ever change in football? No. This is what's called a constant. A constant in computer language is a thing that never changes. The score, the value of how much a touchdown is doesn't change. The value of how much a um, extra point is, well, okay, that one does change. Uh, field goal, field goal doesn't change. Okay, those are constants. The other word that we're going to learn is called a variable. Now, variables obviously opposite of constants, they always change. But we should be able to tell the computer how to store each type of data. And when we do that, we say, is it constant or variable? Well, we say it's constant if it is, and then if it's variable, we don't, we don't have to say anything. Speaking of variables, let's talk about the scoreboard. So we have the time, the score, and how many yards to go for a first down. These are all variable. They change all the time. Hopefully they change in your favor, but they change. That's the thing, they're variables. The score changes. The time's constantly changing. So the reason this is important is we have to teach the computer how to store this data. And we have to teach it that, hey, this data will change. And we also have to tell it what kind of data it is that it's storing so it knows how much room to set aside. If I were to want to store my football equipment in somebody's garage, I should tell them about the size of what I'm storing. You know, I say, oh, I'm bringing over some football equipment. They don't know how much garage space to set aside. If I say I'm bringing over just a football, they know about some space because I've given them a better way of understanding what, what to set aside. Computers are very much like this. You have to tell them how big things are and what they are, a, a little bit about what they are, so that they understand how much space to set aside. That space for a computer is called memory. Now, this is a quick review. Touchdowns are only six points. Field goals are three points. The field's 100 yards. These are all constants. Time, score, yards to go, variables. Now, the other thing I want you to think about is, can any of these have fractions? You know, the yards to go may not be a full yard. It might be inches to go, or it might be three and a half yards to go. Whenever you have a fraction, you can think of it as having also a decimal. It's just like a basic math thing. If it's a fraction, it can have a decimal. And those are different to a computer. It's very important. We'll talk about that in a second. So then this is just another review slide to go over, are there any decimals here? For touchdown, field goal, and field, no. 100 yards, three points, these are whole numbers. The time technically could have a decimal if you think about it in minutes. So if you say how many minutes are left, there's gonna be a certain amount of seconds that could be represented as a fraction of a minute. The main thing here is whenever you're doing programming, you have to understand, can the thing you're, is the thing you're working with going to be a whole number or not? And that will help you when you're setting aside that garage space or setting aside the space in the computer memory for storing your data. 
So again, a, a very quick math thing. If a number has a decimal, it can be considered a floating point number. In computers, we just shorten that down to the word float. If it's a whole number, we call it an integer. One, two, three, four, five, six integers. 1.7, 2.5, floating point number. Okay. There's some more examples up there of integers. Integers can be positive, they can be negative, zero is an integer. Floats are gonna have decimals. So now we're going to go back through those numbers we talked about. We're going to talk about are they integers or floats? Touchdown, field goal, these are integers. And to define them as an integer, we put the word INT in front of it. You can see that in front of field goal, INT field goal equals three. INT, it's short for integer, not interception. And it's telling the computer that, hey, this field goal value is equal to three. The equal sign assigns three to that, that word field goal. From here on out, if we use the word field goal, the computer is going to know three. That's how many points it is. And it's also going to know that it's three as a whole number, and it's going to store it in memory as that because of that INT. It's an integer. The field is a whole number. It's 100 yards. Time, we talked about before, could be a decimal. So it's a floating point number. And to denote that, instead of INT, we use the word float, F-L-O-A-T. So time, the type it is, is float. That's called type. And we put that in front. It's just how we tell the computer to store room in the garage. I guess actually it makes sense. If I were to ask you to store something in the garage, I can say, you know, store, I need to just store a thing a foot long in the garage, and it's a football. And now I've told you some space to set aside. This is very similar to that. F by putting it up front, we're telling the computer, you know, store this amount of space. You can see that all of these have an equal sign and a value after them, even if the thing is zero. So for instance, the home and away score are gonna start off as zero, but we still say equal to zero. The reason being is on a lot of computer languages, if you don't tell it what the value is, the computer kind of makes one up. Um, that's not exactly what happens, but that's what it ends up looking like. So you always wanna give it an initial value that makes sense. For the score, we'll set it to zero. For the time for a quarter, we'll say 15 minutes. For the touchdown and, and field goal, we'll say the appropriate amount of points. So this is a uh, what's called an initializing a variable. Initializing because you're setting a value at the start state, a variable, because that's what these are. These are things that will typically vary. Now we did talk about a couple of these won't vary but you still have to set a value because even if you say it's constant, you have to say, what is it constantly be? Or what, will, what value will it constantly be? So now you can see what I've done is add the word const in front of the ones that are constant. The touchdown is always six points, so we put the word const in front of int. The way this reads for a computer is a constant integer called touchdown is equal to six points. We put the semicolon at the end, and we've been doing that throughout to tell the computer this is the end of the line. There's no, that, that's the end. There's nothing after this. Go on to the next line and start from the beginning to read the next line. Semicolons just denote the end of a line for certain languages. We said const, I have a, a typo for the int, but constant field is 100 yards. Let's see, ah, there's there's an issue here. I said float time is, oh no, float time is 15 because it's a decimal. Float yards to go should be 10.0 to make it a decimal because that can be have inches to go. Float home score and float away score is an error. Did you catch that? Do you know why it's an error? So if we said that we're gonna use integer for whole numbers that don't have decimals, 
And the home score and away score can never have a decimal. You can never have like 5.2 points in football. Then that means that to define those, we should use the word int in front to denote their integers. When we put these words in front to tell the computer how much memory to reserve, like float or int to define the type, that's what, that's what we're doing, it's, it's the type of variable. What kind of variable is this? It's an integer or it's a float. The classes, the blueprints that we talked about in the last section are also types. So if you have a type football player, or in this case, I just shortened it to player. If you have a, a type player, you put it in the front of the name. So you can see we've got player Shane Falco. This creates an object called Shane Falco of type player. This is if, again, if you think of player as a blueprint and I say, hey, put that player on the field, you don't put the blueprint on the field, you would create a player. That player, that instance called Shane Falco that action of doing that, that's this line player Shane Falco, that's what that would look like for the computer. And then you see right under it, we create Steam and Beeman and Rod Tidwell. This is, this is what computer code looks like, basically. You've got a type, a value, and then you'll define a number. And then you've got um, your class types and you give them names and you call methods on them later and you manipulate their properties. And that kind of goes through everything that we've talked about, but we've done it as in the terms of football. I'm hoping that this makes sense. Please let me know in the comments if this is useful and if this helps you out. If you've been trying to learn code, this might have helped get you through some blocks that you hit. And if it's useful, then I'll continue it on. I'll, I'll make a series out of it. Thank you for watching this and please leave comments below if it was useful. If it's useful and I get enough comments, then what I'll do is I'll continue the series and we'll go into uh, loops and go from there. Eventually I'd like to take this series into actual coding on an Arduino or an Arduino simulator. So you're actually doing actual code and you'll be able to reference back to this and see how it lines up. Thanks for watching. Appreciate the feedback. I'm so thankful for the subscribers and likes. If you subscribe to this, then you'll get a notification when I upload the next video in the series. I'm hoping to do about three or four of these in a row and we'll see how it goes from there. Thanks again for watching. Until next time.